Well, good afternoon, Casey. Thank you so much for joining me on this call. I always enjoy every uh, chance we get a, uh, an opportunity to talk because I love hearing your insights into what's happening in the market. So we, I want to talk economics. I want to talk industrial real estate. Maybe we could even add a few things like the office and retail market as well. But first, thanks again for joining me on the call. You bet. I always enjoy it. Thanks, Jed. So you you said that you started up a parsing through some economic data this morning. What to, what did you see? <laughs> what did you find out already? So, so we had our first initial estimate on Q4 GDP from 2022. And <clears throat> it surprised everybody came in a positive 2.9%. You know, I, I'm in the camp that it has it positive. But one of the big skewers in the thing was airline orders. And so it's a, such a big ticket, they skewed the number. And Boeing had massive, almost record orders. Uh, you know, everybody wasn't flying and buying planes for two years in COVID. Now they are. Airbus is open. The Boeing planes got approved and certified. China's, you know, reopening. We're seeing air traffic's big. So that air, that number in transportation and airlines is so big. If you take it out, GDP would have only been around 1%. The second thing is it's a backward-looking indicator right now. So it's skewed over a quarter. So things were still kind of positive in, you know, October uh, time frame going into Thanksgiving. And so that doesn't reflect at all what we've seen really through December and into 2023. Massive job cuts, over 80,000 in tech. None of those are factored as unemployed yet. Um, retail sales weak. Uh, energy prices rising because we're about done with the strategic petroleum reserve gimmick. We got China opening, you know, putting pressure on energy prices. Um, housing is in a complete recession. Builder cancellation rates are off the charts. You know, you're going to KB homes at 68%. Um, you look at the maturity defaults happening in commercial real estate. I just don't think that this was a number that is at all reflective of what we're going to see in 2023. And um, I, I, I would short it and uh, and still keep my head down and be prepared for a, a bumpy ride. It also means that the Fed's going to continue its rate hike path here February 1st. When you get this strong a GDP number on top of everything else and they can't get unemployment where they want it, it means they've got to continue with at least another 50 basis points February 1. So the number, the headline looked great. You dig through it. It's all about airlines. It's backward looking and it's not at all predictive of what we're seeing happening through December and into January that I think is really going to set the tone for us in 2023. Yeah, they're Sorry to be the bear. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm with you. I, I'm I'm a naturally very optimistic person, but I agree. I I think that there's that that cliche of headwinds and tailwinds, which we all heard last year. I I think this is the year where the storm actually comes in. There's the headwinds and the tailwinds that were we're we're coming in. I think this is the year where we actually have to deal with the storm. Uh, I I'm I'm bullish long term. I've I, I've been through a few downturns and I've. I've noticed that they they range in severity, but they also always seem to pass. So I I can't predict the future. My crystal balls as murky as anyone's, but I do think that we we do come out of this in due course. But I think that this is going to be a tough year for for the reasons that you mentioned with interest rates. And and I've found we were talking offline on this as well that bid ask spread right now between sellers still wanting to have peak pricing and buyers saying, well, pricing's come down because I can afford less. The cost of debt has increased so much that I just can't pay the same price. That chasm is huge right now. With interest rates being the driving narrative, you th you're you thinking 50 basis points February 1, because they meet on the 29th, I believe, right? They have a Yeah, 31st rate. in February, 31st, January 31st and February 1. So it's coming up next week. So they're trying to wrangle in inflation and their lever that they're, they're pulling is interest rates. What, what do you think is in store after they put in that 50 basis points, if, assuming it is 50 basis points? Yeah, I think we could see a series of 50 basis point increases like we did the 75, three or four of those. Uh, if they don't see these economic numbers, rising unemployment, slowing GDP, they've got to stay on track. That's all they know how to do, as well as their balance sheet. We may see some more aggressive behavior on the balance sheet, selling it off. Right now, they've only been playing with the treasuries. They haven't been playing with things like mortgage-backed securities mm -hmm. that affect our our capital. Um, but once they start there, we'll see some real damage. So I see, you know, we probably got three or more uh, rate hikes here, probably all 50s. Then they slow to a series of 25. And then they may by, you know, summer or fall say, okay, let's, we finally get to five and a half percent overnight rate. We're not even at 5% yet. So 
they've got at least 75 basis points more to get to where they want to be. And then you've got Fed presidents like Jim Board out of St. Louis, who's been right on inflation, saying, look, at I think we have to go to 7%. And so if he's right, we're in real trouble. But I think the best case scenario is we get to a point where they go, you know, probably 350s, a couple of 325s, and then they pause. But they leave them there. Anybody thinks that there's rate high, rate cuts coming, they're crazy. It's not going to happen this year. It's going to take a long time. And think of the headwinds on inflation that are coming. We have energy going back up. So we're coming off of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve scheme that brought energy prices down. That's about run out the last of those contracts are playing out. You've got China, uh, you know, trying to reopen to keep the the, the population, you know, uh, from up, from uprising. So they're going to put pressures on energy. They're going to be sucking it up. Um, uh, which they weren't doing during the SPR and, and, and during the COVID and uh, on commodity prices. So, uh, and we still have massive food inflation, strong wage inflation and services. So one of the terms I've been using is we've been using core and non-core inflation for years to talk about inflation. Well, I think we need to interject a new, new term called super core <laughs> and super core is wages and services inflation. And both of those are running over 10%. So I think the Fed has to stay on rate hike mode I don't see any rate cuts this year. I see them taking us to five and a half percent over overnight rate. So if you put a 200 basis point margin on that for for bank and, and lending and capital uh, deployment, you know you're at seven and a half plus percent rates for our for our industry, and the numbers just don't work anymore. You had shared a slide that you gave to a presentation in in Utah about how in uh, interest rates have risen at the fastest pace in decades. So it's still historically lower than what some of those increases were, but the the pace it went it went went up was the fastest. When they're trying to raise rates this quick to get ahead of of inflation, do they run the risk of increasing it too quickly? That by the time all the existing debt comes up, either for renewal or people want to refinance or they want to sell, and they've got to either secure new debt or deal with the the debt that they have. Do they run the risk of overcorrecting that interest rate and causing more of a severe recession than than they're anticipating? Oh, absolutely. You're spot on on that observation. So let me give you a good example on that. So they want to see higher unemployment. So we have all these massive job cuts coming, 80,000 in the tech center. Challenger Gray is the source I go to that tracks all of the job cuts. And so when these when these jobs are cut, you get a severance benefit. And that severance benefit prevents you from filing for unemployment insurance and be counting, being counted as unemployed. So that typically takes anywhere from three, four to six or more months, depending on the industry tech, they're much more generous. So these cuts won't show up as job cuts and unemployment, maybe until late spring or summer next year. So by the Fed not focusing on that, they've already done demand destruction. It's already happening at a massive level. The other one they're not seeing is look at what's happening in in retail and store closings. We're in a whole new round of apocalypse, you know, a, a retail apocalypse number two, three, or four. We've been doing it for a decade, but you know, look at every and it's going down into the grocery store level now. Save a lot, uh, which is one that does kind of smaller markets. Just announced a big round. You know, you got Macy's. You've got you know what's going to happen with all the stores with Bed Bath and Beyond and and uh, and their and their trouble. So every element I look at, whether it's um, job cuts, um, all the demand destruction that's happening, the Fed isn't counting that. And they want to stick to, I got to see un unemployment. By the time they see unemployment, they will have destroyed this economy. And, and what I say is, you know, the Fed has two mandates, uh, price stability, the inflation, and full employment. So they blew price stability, right? The no inflation, trans transitory, transitory longer. Forget we ever said transitory. Oh, my God, there is inflation, but we're too chicken to raise rates last January, February. So we'll do a little bit in March, then we'll really get aggressive over the summer. So they blew that. Now we have full employment, or we did. And so I ask them frequently when I when I'm in, when I know they're in the audience or I get to do I got a couple of briefings coming up later uh, this year that would you do you think the American people would rather be employed and deal with their budget to manage higher inflation or would they rather be unemployed and still dealing with inflation and, and they don't get it these are all academics and they're going to destroy this second mandate which is full employment and by the time they see it it'll be too late to turn around because once companies do all those cuts and they pay all that money um, out and they get lean and they cut the office space, 
it doesn't turn around in two or three or four quarters. So it's going to be a longer term thing. So absolutely, um, they're missing all the demand destruction variables. And then you add in the debt of where a lot of people and companies have uh, fixed debt. Uh, so it's not necessarily floating or variable where it they feel that impact right away. They If someone is has a, call it a five-year mortgage and they're in year four right now and they're coming up for renewal next year, they're going to be in for a huge, but this year they'll be in for a huge sticker shock. So they might not even be feeling that yet, but it's going to be all that debt that matures or rolls over uh, this year. How how are people going to deal with this? And this can be as granular as like the homeowner that's going to see their monthly mortgage increase five hundred dollars or thousand dollars a month, up to a company that that's going to be a, a factor of ten perhaps on that, and then even all the governments uh, that have have uh, funded their programs and everything on the back of debt. How is everybody going to deal with this rapid increase in interest rates that they weren't expecting a year ago? Yeah, so good question. Let's look at residential and then let's look at commercial. So residential, most existing homeowners, you know, have disproportionately a fixed rate mortgage. They're in the three to four percent range. Mm -hmm. So why in the world, especially if you're an empty nester or someone like me that's 60, why would I sell my home and have to go buy something that costs more? You may have to come up with more equity or take a mortgage out. It's going to be a seven percent money. So existing inventory is just drying up. It's collapsing. Um, and the realtors have data, Zillow have data on, on how much existing inventory is just collapsing because why would I trade in my three something percent mortgage for seven, double that and move? I'm not going to. So then let's look at the existing, the, the new homeowners or people that have to move maybe for a job. They can't afford, they can't qualify. That's what we're seeing with builder cancellation rates. KB Homes, a good home building company, just reported a 68% cancellation rate on, on contracts because when the bank came back in and said, yeah, we approved you six months ago at a three and a half or four percent mortgage and now you don't qualify at seven, they have an out and they cancel the contract. So 68% like KB, look at a home builder like DR Horton that builds mostly on spec. And now they're looking at, well, our model was, you know, that we could do it at three and a half, four percent mortgages. Now at seven, this inventory isn't selling. That's why we have this massive housing crisis. We're in a housing crisis and recession that is every bit as bad as what 2009 was. It's just, it's on a different side. It's on builders. It's the people that can't buy. It's the lack of inventory that can be put into place. So that you're going to have more demand on rental. So I don't see the complete collapse in multifamily because if you can't buy and you can't qualify and you don't have the down payment, you're forced into a rental situation. So I think we can continue to see pretty decent rental increases, the rents at least covering the expense increases. So uh, you're exactly right. The housing industry, uh, it's in for a, probably every bit as bad as what 2008, 9, and 10 were. On the mm -hmm. commercial side, you're right. We have what are called maturity defaults. So TREP has a great report. They do an annual forensic report. Uh, called the year in review. And uh, if you if you just sign on and give them your identification information, they'll send it to you for free. It's a phenomenal read. And their, their headline for what we're doing on refinancing in the year ahead is drama, thriller, or chainsaw massacre. <laughs> <laughs> and, and under anybody that has a loan that's maturing in the next 24 months, and especially then if you have a lot of tenant turnovers, a lot of these office buildings are contracting, the sublet space, they underwrite that as vacant. It's a chainsaw massacre. And I think it's something like 530 uh, CMBS loans are, are primarily office pools that have to mature. And it's hundreds of office buildings um, that face this um, maturity default. And even if you had the numbers, you had long-term leases, you had all of that, nobody wants the office building. No one wants to finance one. No one wants to own one. The risks are too high. So I think if you're in office, it's a chainsaw massacre. If you're industrial, even industrial, we have big uh, clients that we advise that are merchant kind of developers. And they're saying, look, it, we still have the tenant. We still have the rent. We still have all the fundamentals in place, but the bank won't make my construction loan. They won't let me do the A&D loan to build the industrial building. Or if I'm finishing it and I need to move it into a perm loan, there is nobody that'll do it or the numbers they want are at like 7% interest rates. So even something as healthy as industrial, it's that capital lockup, that LTC. Timing's terrible and capital is locked up. So you can have the best location, the best industrial underwriting, tenant, everything, and you can't get capital. And we're seeing um, reported to us from the major brokerages that something like one in three to one in four industrial loans are being canceled um, and they're falling out of escrow 
because the banks are saying, sorry, we just we're, we're told not to lend. You know, remember, lending is economic activity. That's inflationary. Don't lend. And the Fed, they can go buy a two year treasury bond at four and a half percent. Why would the fit? Why would a bank lend and take risk and have to go through the stress tests and, you know, more a triple L. So um, I think on the commercial side, it really is more like more than a thriller and more like a chainsaw massacre. If you're multifamily and industrial, it's probably a thriller. Um, but if you're everybody else, it's probably a chainsaw massacre. So it's uh, it's like, you know, my, my dad taught me is I grew up in, in Colorado and during the 70s and he was a ski resort developer, was a land guy over in Vail and doing stuff. And there was no capital when Volcker, you know, took things to 21 percent prime. And uh, and he's, he said, you know, Casey, this thing they teach us about location, location, location. It's really about timing and capital. And the location is a fundamental. It's kind of like a foundation. But to get everything else done in the leasing and sell the thing and permanent financing, that's the timing and capital. Right now, timing, uh, it, it just, I'm going to say it, it sucks. <laughs> and that's a new economic term, S-U-X. And the capital, <laughs> it's just, it's non-existent. It's, it's the old, some people may remember the old NCNB bank out in North Carolina. We used to joke it was no cash for nobody. We're back to NCNB, no cash for nobody banking. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's good. I like that. I'm going to I'm going to use that myself. What <laughs> what happens in this scenario then? Uh, so because there's still healthy industrial demand, especially in some hot markets where there's still sub two percent vacancy. So if these developers aren't able to develop because they can't get financing, what happens? Does does that just put pressure on the existing inventory, or what's what's your short term outlook on this? Yeah, so we've had one glimpse into that. Um, uh, CBRE just put out a new industrial report. And it was very strong on absorption and leasing. And what they found is, especially on retailers and e-commerce and wholesalers, they were snapping up every existing big box out there that was completed. And so I think it was one of the highest years that they saw of over 1 million square foot leasing. And the, and the markets that led were places we, we wouldn't necessarily think would be that. So uh, the Inland Empire in Southern California had the most 1 million square foot leases of anywhere in the country followed by Chicago. So I thought everybody was leaving California and Chicago according to the U-Haul report <laughs> and all the demand was in the it was in the south, you know, Texas to, you know, Carolinas and Florida. So what that tells us is existing retailers and e-commerce folks are knowing it's going to get very difficult to get new inventory, to get new warehouses where they want them. So they better snap up everything they can. There were no rent concessions, rents were up almost 10% absorption was strong. So I think the the industry, the users, the occupiers are realizing there's going to be a, a crunch on new product that the developers can't get the financing. So they're, they're scraping up or snapping up everything they can. Now, they've also started talking to me about something very innovative. So all these companies have been buying back their stock because they don't know what to do with all that extra cash that they've got. So several of them have approached me and said, would it make sense for us to take some of that stock buyback money and us finance our own new inventory, or we be the construction lender, or we be the owner. Mm -hmm. And we now know with the lease accounting rules where it's punitive, you got to put your leases on your balance sheet, there's actually an accounting incentive to own your own real estate. And I think one thing we may see evolve this year and next year is that more big companies and e-commerce users and manufacturers, you know, like the Procter & Gamble, they may turn to that merchant developer and say, I need five new buildings and I need them in these locations. And I know you can't get a loan from the bank. So why don't I fund that? Why don't I be the owner? And the only problem they have is they go, how do we manage the construction draw process? How do we do it? Well, that's an easy solution. We can put a third party in there. It's independent. They can keep an eye on the money and make sure it gets properly deployed in the building built. But I think we're going to see companies and occupiers shift to more of this ownership and financing the building of their new buildings uh, when the banks won't do it and the banks lose these big customers. So I, I think the, the merchant developers and those that have viable deals with good tenants may see their tenants come to the rescue as a financing mechanism in some fashion. How fascinating is that? And, and I've been doing this for a while and I never would have thought we'd see the day where a company comes and finances their own building instead of perhaps even just buying it outright themselves they'll still stay on as a tenant they'll just hold the note on the mortgage yeah and it, it makes sense the challenge is how do they account for the risk you know of getting it built making sure it gets done the draws are done right the money's not misappropriated well we know from the bank world we know how to do construction drawing construction management and we can put under contract and it might be another 
half to 1% on the, on the, on the price of the property. But again, when you think about these big e-commerce facilities that are happening into a million, when you're a retailer and you can build one of these big new e-commerce things of around a million square feet, three quarter million, you can typically close something like 100 stores. So think of the savings and the redundant inventory and the staff and that other real estate. So putting another half to 1% in to do construction management of the draws is nothing. And I think when we show them how easy that can be with that merchant developer, that's high quality, he's got a good track record. And then you add in the lease accounting rules that say, it's better for you to own that building than have a lease that's now a new liability on your balance sheet. It's kind of those those things that come together, you know, perfect storm or, you know, perfect nightmare, or whatever. But we have several things converging that I think could make this a reality. So would the company in that case hire the merchant developer to build it and then they would buy it afterwards or would they stay on as a tenant? Yeah, so we may see two structures where they actually come in and buy buy the land position out and have the merchant developer on a fee basis develop for fee, or they may say, you know, we really don't want this land on our balance sheet. So you you do the land, but what we'll do is we'll fund an agreement. We'll have an agreement where we fund up front, uh, you know, kind of like the banks would do on an A and D draw loan. They do so much on the land, maybe fifty percent up, and we'll give you a draw and a fee as you go along as a completion. And then you, we mutually agree on who's going to be the third party to manage the the draws and the allocation. So just like each quarter, instead of so much going into buying stocks back, they go and put it to the construction draw manager to fund the draws. And, you know, they have an appraisal that gets updated that shows here's the asset growing on the balance sheet, just like a bank would uh, on a construction loan. And then when it's completed, they, they deed it over. We did this in a REIT that I was involved with Um Monmouth. So Monmouth was a great industrial REIT, 50 plus year old. We got tangled up in a hostile takeover action. And what we would do is we would go to that merchant developer and say, look, we'll pre we'll pre-agree to buy this building from FedEx or Amazon or Home Depot. So the only thing that'll float will be the rent and the cap rate. So we'll, we'll try to agree on the rent right now based on the cost and the cap rate will float based on the market or the rent may float based on cost overruns. But you've got two years out when this is done. We have a contract. We've never not close and we'll buy that building. The merchant developer then could take that agreement with us and they could go to almost anybody and get financing for that because you had a takeout, you had no market risk and you had the cost overruns all taken care of. So we were doing that before it was cool to think about doing that at, at Monmouth. And uh, and I think we're going to see that, that structure uh, and people um, follow that because these big e-commerce and a supply chain entities need these assets. They need more of them. We're remaking our supply chain from West Coast to more North South. So we've got to build all these new assets from the ports and along the rail. So it's not an option to not build. It's how do we help that merchant developer that's got the skill set get the capital. And so if the banks are going to escape and not do it, um, then they will. The other one that we're seeing is different sources of international money coming in. So the traditional life companies are kind of pulling back as well, um, although they really like industrial. Um, and so we're seeing from like Vietnam and South Korea, you know, the United Emirates, you know, places that have lots of capital to deploy. And many of them are saying, we don't want a debt structure. We'll do all equity or we'll come in in a different structure. So I think we're going to see capital come in in different places. The one sign of hope that I'll give is a lot of people go attend the mortgage bankers uh, annual craft commercial real estate finance conference. They have uh, coming up right before Super Bowl. And I think it's back in San Diego this year. And so all the life companies get all their allocation of money for the new year. And so they're looking to see what's out there. Well, what people forget is all that capital that the life companies are sitting on for 2023 was raised last year when they sold annuities and insurance products. And that capital had a cost of like three and a half to 4%. So they've got capital that's priced at three to 4% range that they could deploy and ignore the Fed. Now, what are they going to do? Are they going to deploy it at four or do they want a little bit more, maybe go to five? But I think we're going to see some interesting behavior by the life companies because their cost of capital isn't tied to the Fed or the 10-year treasury. It's tied to products they sold last year that they can deploy at 4% capital. So I think there's a lot of, di- and they want industrial. So right now the life companies and pension funds, you know, they've got 25% in office and 10 to 15% in industrial, and they want to completely flip that. And so they, they'll, they'll, I think they'll pay up for that and they'll make others pay a higher price or a higher premium um, than industrial because they want that product. They want to get up to that 20, 25% ratio range. So a lot of stuff's going to change this year. 
it's going to be a fascinating year to watch this unfold. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on that other side of the equation then. So if they're shifting into industrial, which makes sense, there's healthy demand for a, a strong foreseeable outlook. What on the other side, you've got retail and you've got office. Uh, so I'd love to get your thoughts on both because office is, is known right now for having increasing vacancy rate. A lot of companies are repositioning how much space they actually need. If they're coming off five or 10 year leases, those are starting to mature now. So what do, what do you, what's the outlook? We'll start with office. I want to get your thoughts on retail and e-commerce as well, but what, what's your outlook on the office market right now? You know, I've been as bearish as you can be for a long time. I went back to last year saying, you know, just the remote work thing was really playing out in the office. Then you throw the cost of capital and nobody wanting it on, on top of it. So the saying I've been using for you know six, nine months has been that remote work will be to office what e-commerce was to big box retail. Mm -hmm. And, and you, when we put apocalyptic terms on there, companies are doing sublet to dump space uh, to try to get rid of it. They're not gonna renew the same amount of square footage. They're going to the suburbs and they're leasing smaller chunks of space uh, close to workforce um, rather than big downtown urban space. So I think the downtown urban office market is a chainsaw massacre. Uh, companies may renew in a building, but instead of 20,000 square feet, it may only be 10,000 square feet because um, of the flex and people coming in two days a week or two afternoons. Then you throw on top of that the cost of, of capital and the number's not working in the maturity defaults, nobody wants it. So I'll give you um, a highlight. So in the urban, uh, the other big read I'd recommend people read is if they haven't read the 2023 Urban Land Institute Emerging Trends Report, a fascinating development in there. So for the first time in the history of the Emerging Trends Report, and I was involved with the first one at Equitable Real Estate 25 plus years ago, um, that for the first time, office, did not rank in the top three for investment uh, option or preferred investment options in commercial real estate. Hotel moved into third place. And so hotel had never been in a position to displace office or, or retail, and started retail a few years ago, but office to fall out of the top three. It's in the bottom, it's in the bottom category. That's very telling. And that was every entity that was surveyed in the Urban Land Institute membership that had anything to do with office had that same comment that we don't want to touch office. And we're conditioned to think that you know, usually hotel and retail go in the toilet first in a recession. And so we're conditioned to think that hotel should go in the toilet. And we're finding out that's not happening. Hotel is performing actually pretty well. And there's a new term that's being applied to hotels called boo leisure, B-U for business. So business leisure. And so I'm guilty of it. The, the trips I've taken so far this year and the end of last year of the holidays, I can work remote at a hotel, just like at my home. And so I'm extending, if I'm going to places like Salt Lake and I want to ski, extend a day or to do some skiing, or I want to go to a place that's got a lake or a mountain or a beach or whatever, I'm extending one or two days and I'm doing work there. And, um, and so I'm extending the leisure piece onto my business piece and that hotel stuff is through the roof and the hotels have also discovered through covid unlike the other property types they've actually cut costs so they've gone on all of our all of our devices like these so the check-in is through an app so i do everything i'm trying to think the last time i went to a, a desk and checked in uh even when i was out in la it was all automated you know i got the qr code and i put it up at the at the uh, door uh, device and uh, it let me in and i checked out and uh, so I was doing a case recently for one of the major hotel chains and the CEO was telling me what they're having to pay for maids and the prices of the, for the wages have gone from like say 30 to under 40,000 to over $60,000 a year for a maid. And I said, well, how's that going over in your expenses and the rest of the operations? And he goes, well, my, my administrative and my non-maid staff are very upset. And I said, well, why is that? And he goes, we're paying maids now more than we're paying some of our administrative and office staff. And so when they complain to me, I tell them, look at folks, I can develop an app to do everything you do, accounting, check-in, but I can't get develop an app to clean the darn room. So I'm going to pay up to get the room cleaned and the rest of you, I'm going to expense out of here. I'm going to put an app in place. And so those are the things that I think we're not prepared for. We're not prepared in underwriting, capital investment, we're missing those connecting the dots and what, what COVID did, what inflation's doing. And so hotel 
is a big beneficiary of really what, what COVID did and teaching them how to do expense control and everything else. Office is terrible because you tack on remote work with inflation and the cost of these assets and the rising inflation and the CapEx that's needed for all the foot levers and individualized HVAC. So you think that your space is clean and it didn't go through somebody else's air in the building, um, adding more EV charging stations, all of that kind of stuff, energy efficiencies. Um, office is being crushed by both capital improvements, sublet space, the shrinking office, and then where they want to go is the suburbs. And the only place that an office building really makes sense today is an office location near the remote work. Because now I can go in. I don't have a long commute. I don't have to take public transportation. I'm in and out. Uh, I don't want to go downtown. And some recent surveys have done, and they've quantified this. And depending on whether you're northeast or west coast um, and, and other big interior markets, like, say, Chicago, Atlanta, Dallas, uh, it's somewhere between $600 and $900 a month that the office worker was incurring commuting costs, parking costs, buying lunch, dry cleaning. And you'd give that, that remote worker six to $900 a month back. Maybe they can deal with some of these inflation issues. And who's the, who's the sacrificial lamb? That's going to be the office. So I'm very, very bearish on office, especially the urban high rise stuff. And then on, uh, on the retail side, we're back in retail apocalypse. I mean, uh, it's fewer stores. We've got, you know, two to 300 more malls that are going to close. Uh, the, the local government still think retail is coming back, so they won't allow them to be uh, adaptively reused. We just had a big one in North Atlanta, uh, Alpharetta, very fluent market. The One of the last new malls from 25 years ago is is dying and the anchors are closing. And the local government wouldn't approve the, the re redevelopment of that because they think retail is coming back and they don't want high density housing because they think high density housing is is evil for the local economy. It's just mind boggling. So, um, and then on the retail side, they're increasingly figuring out how to deal with fewer smaller stores where you can do a return. So you might have 10 stores in a city and you can contract that to two, you know, on either part of the city where I can go look at an item, test it, place my order, return it, get questions answered, but they don't need the other eight stores. And I think that's what we're seeing in this latest round of store closings. It's not just big box, it's even Old Navy. The old Navy is, is seeing the same thing. They're closing stores. And even in markets like Chicago. So <laughs> not a lot to be optimistic about on that, on the, on the office and, and retail side. And I'm, I'm sure we could go into depth on that uh, as well, but I'd really love to get your thoughts on industrial. And I'd say a good portion of industrial demand has been driven by that shift towards e-commerce, but a, a nascent uh, area of, of industrial that seems to be getting some traction, I want to get your insights into this, is the manufacturing side. And whether that's just a, the government trying to throw throw money at it to try and entice more people to develop uh, and then reshore or onshore back to North America, uh, or whether it's the potential of having Mexico take advantage of the Kansas City uh, a KCS merger that's supposed to be announced sometime in March, I believe now. Yeah. What what are your thoughts on what the demand drivers will be for industrial and and even just the tenant profile is is because companies will be subjected to the same economic pressures, whether it's from economic reasons or just interest rate driven risk they're going to be subjected to this as well what where do you think demand is that tenant profile and just the health of the industrial market right now uh the fundamentals are very strong nothing's changed we need more of this space remember if we're if we're believing in my theory that you know my first my golden triangle where we're 70 80 percent of all the manufacturing expansion which is the great lakes down to texas and all the way through the southeast um and that's where half our gdp and 70 percent of our population live so I've been promulgating that since the start of the expansion of the Panama Canal. And now layer in that we're going to redo our supply chain from West Coast, you know, to Chicago in the east to more north south. And that's being validated by things like the Canadian Pacific Kansas City Southern merger. Plus, you're seeing all the other class one railroads buying up the smaller gauge railroads in Montana and in the interior to feed more into them. So Union Pacific, Burlington, Northern Santa Fe have all been in like Montana and in, in the Intermountain West. Um, buying up these smaller gauge to feed stuff into their main line that all goes, you know, more east west or goes into a north south um, supply chain. So, you know, everything we're doing, whether it's new stuff in Columbus, Ohio, you know, or Atlanta or uh, Huntsville, Alabama, or Montgomery, Alabama, the new inland port for the Port of Mobile, um, all these interior locations, 
they're booming. They need the supply chain and they need connectivity to port, rail, and in short distance interstate. So my old logistics transformer where I had the air cargo wings on the shoulder and the shipping containers as a plate and the arms is rail and the legs is the trucks with the tractor trailer sticking out that I did at the University of Alabama, it's still very valid. And so I think we're going to see another big rail merger to basically compete with the Canadian Pacific merger with Kansas City Southern. So the shift in clients and, and, and uh, goods moving on Kansas City Southern and Canadian Pacific has just boomed. Uh, the price of that stock is almost at an all-time high. It's it's you know probably a you know a hold or a sell right now because the price is so is so high. Moving from Canada now to Mexico and all the components back up. Well, Canadian National has been the one to suffer, and they can't they cannot go without doing a major U.S. rail acquisition. So my theory is they're going to go after either Norfolk Southern or CSX Rail, and that gets them down. CSX gets them down into Florida. Norfolk Southern gets them down and deep into the south, and then a U-turn back up into all the mid-Atlantic and the northeast. And so it's 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 more of that. It's it's driving that. So this logistics infrastructure really moves from the Great Lakes in Canada down through the heart of the southeast and the Gulf into Mexico. And uh, so those fundamentals are are not there. It's just where do we get the capital to help the developer build the space? The rents are up, the absorption's up, the value of those assets are up. Um, you know, what used to cost 100 125 bucks to build and buy is now staying above 200 bucks a square foot. So none of those fundamentals are changing. It's just how do we how do we get the capital piece back in place? I think the life companies and pension and others, the perm capital will step in because they all want and love industrial. So the perm piece will come in place. But what do the rents have to be to justify, you know, debt at, you know, six or seven percent on the industrial versus three or four? And the cap rates, I think, can They'll move up a little bit on industrial. Maybe they'll go from the, you know, the four to five range or even sub four, you know, into that five to six percent range. But they're not going to do like what the office and retail, which is try thinking about eight percent cap rate range. So the fundamentals of industrial good. The capital is what's locked up. The supply chain remake is occurring. The rail mergers and consolidation is very strong. And I'll give you a really odd market to prove this point. Little Rock, Arkansas. So at Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, sitting there and they attract tractor supply for their last year for their big new e-commerce fulfillment and Nucor. So Nucor is building their biggest, newest um, steel plant right there in Little Rock, Arkansas. And you scratch your head and go, why Little Rock, Arkansas? You know, what, what do they have going on for them other than the Razorbacks, right? Well, they got this little river called the Arkansas River that flows into the lower Mississippi into the Port of Mobile. So every heavy good can move up and down the river, even with the lower water levels. And, and you're across from Memphis, so you can get all that you need in workforce or, you know, if you need new Nike shoes for your workers, you can get them and move them over easy. Um, and so here's a place nobody thought about or had on their radar screen that is absolutely booming on industrial. Another one is Montgomery, Alabama. So last year I worked with um, the state and the, a key developer down there, Jim Wilson Associates, to get the first inland port developed in Alabama. So the Port of Mobile is completely redone. It's now a container port. They'll surpass the Port of Charleston within probably two or three years with Airbus and with Walmart and uh, cars that you know now they have the operations they can roll on, roll off down there. But they needed to come inland because the historic nature of Mobile was that they didn't want to destroy that. The port was already big. So they needed an inland port. So we did the work and convinced them it was in Montgomery. We got it all done. What happens? Hyundai rewards them with a second automobile plant. So they got new FedEx, new Amazon, two Hyundai plants. They're getting probably an EV plant. It absolutely is booming because of the location of the logistics infrastructure. It's connected to a port, has an inland port, has rail, all of those type of things. Uh, we got five railroads that go down to um, the Port of Mobile, three to the Port Freeport, which is another one. So um, that's part of the story. Now, I'll give you a really good example. Uh, I think it was in my slides. If not, it'll be in the CCIM member only one next Tuesday. And we looked at where all of the EV battery plants are being made, man, you know, where they're being built, and where the EV car manufacturing is. And so Argonne, A-R-G-O-N-N-E, in the Department of, um, of Energy, Put this new report together for the end of last year and they put all the dots of the ev plants and they got another one that we've added that puts all the, the car manufacturing that needs those evs and you basically look at this ring from the great lakes you look at um, michigan michigan's claiming now they're the biggest but it's it's 
it's not. They're playing with statistics, but it's important. So you got Michigan, you got Ohio, you got Kentucky, all of those coming down all the way to the southeast, Alabama, Georgia. And then you have Texas down into Mexico. And it's all the EV plants, it's all the EV car manufacturing, all the component manufacturers, everything coming out of Asia, VinFast out of Vietnam, Hyundai, you know, trying to, you know, be bigger than uh, be bigger than everybody else. And so that's a very powerful graphic that shows right in the golden triangle, right where all the supply chain is being remade, batteries, cars, you know, everything that needs anything electric, battery, component, appliances, you name it, is all right there. So it's that remaking our supply chain north south. And uh, that's a big driver of the industrial where it's going. Yeah, it's fascinating to to watch that all unfold. And and I you were the one that actually introduced me to that uh, Canadian Pacific uh, KCS merger when it was uh, percolating uh, last year. It's gone. It's a long regulatory process. They were originally expecting to have uh, uh, the uh, the be granted the authority from the service transportation board in January. And then that's gotten pushed out to some environmental issues. I was reading into it and it is a boondoggle of red tape and bureaucracy, but uh, hopefully that does get approved. Cause I, I think that having a single rail network connecting Canada, the U S and Mexico will be very powerful and, uh -huh. and, and really insulate us from shocks that happen in supply chain issues, whether it's China doing another lockdown or just bottlenecks in general. If we can put more uh, emphasis on North American made, I, I think that that would be a, a benefit, uh, notwithstanding the the loss of globalization and everything that goes with that, though. Yeah, no, it's it's the first class one railroad for all of North America. That's a big, mm -hmm. big deal. And all, you know, with the new USMCA or NAFTA too. That helps all of that stuff. So just think of everything from Canada, all the commodities, whether it's potash or lithium or lumber that can move down through the center of the country to all the manufacturing and all the way down to Mexico. And then Mexico making all the components that we need for cars and autos and appliances that can move back up for assembly and higher value stuff into the U.S. It's huge. And remember that on that Canadian Pacific Kansas City Southern merger, Canadian National was the original winner. And that deal two mm -hmm. plus years ago, and then they couldn't they couldn't get their regulatory approval. Uh, the Surface Transportation Board wouldn't approve it. Mexico didn't like something about the agreement. So Canadian Pacific watched all that. They've made a better deal that fixed all those things, swept in and stole the darn thing from Canadian National. And that's why I think Canadian National is got to come and they got to look at. It. And the only two options that really make sense are Norfolk Southern and CSX. It can give them you know new new access to new markets and new things and new ports from. Port Everglades in Florida and uh, all the Florida ports in Savannah and Charleston and then the whole Midwest. And we're, you know, you think about it, 70% of our population, I'm sorry, uh, half our GDP and 70% of our population are east of that. So they're east of where the Canadian Pacific Kansas City rail line is. So uh, I, that's my one stock pick. And they're all beaten up right now because they haven't had goods coming in from China and containers and they're not moving stuff. So everybody's misreading the why the lower rail traffic and it's because of China primarily having been locked down, but that that can change real quickly here. So I, I appreciate all the insight. I want to be respectful of your time uh, on that. So that's a good note to, to wrap up on. Uh, and I'd love to get your concluding remarks on perhaps what you think is in store or what people should be following this year to, to be in tune and on top of things with everything that could be changing as fast as it does. Yeah. So I think the one thing, doesn't matter whether you're in California or you're Texas or you're Florida, the one thing that's going to affect all of us in commercial real estate and real estate is capital. And capital's locked up. Nobody can get to it. So it doesn't matter how good your fundamentals are, you're going to have stress. And if you've got a maturity coming, you're going to have a maturity default. How do you work through that? Who are the experts that you use? Where do you look at alternative sources of capital? Do companies quit buying stock back and help own their real estate and help you step in there? Or is there another solution? But capital is the key piece. The Fed's not going to come off of that. They're going to keep it worse. We'll have another rate hike here for the end of the month and, and February 1st. And I think we, we, we see them follow that if we keep getting these kinds of GDP or jobs numbers that show, you know, 3% or less unemployment, the Fed's not going to come off the accelerator. They're not going to do the timeout and do the demand destruction as say, an Esther George, who's retiring from the Kansas City Fed, or a Jim Bullard from the St. Louis Fed are advocating. So they're going to miss all of the demand destruction. They're going to take us over the cliff. And about, it's kind of like a Roadrunner cartoon when the, when the coyote is about halfway over the cliff, does he realize, 
oh God, I'm really screwed. I'm I'm gonna die here <laughs> in the road in the roadrunners up there going beep beep. <laughs> I told you so. Um, so don't look for any relief from the Fed. That's gonna be our biggest challenge. Um, the thing I would look at is kind of a basket that pulls it all together. A little over a year ago, the CCIM Institute and Site to Do Business, we created this new index called CREPI, the Commercial Real Estate Performance Index. And you can go to site to do business.com forward slash CREPI. And what we did is we tried to identify 10 windshield indicators, things that are looking out the front of the windshield, things like, you know, job cuts or the Green Street Commercial Property Price Index or um, those things that, that are predictive of what's coming at us in the windshield. We put those 10 together and we uh, put an index together and we tested it all the way back to the last century. And we found we never missed, that index never missed a downturn, a, you know, a trough or a, re a recurring peak by more than one or two quarters. And so we saw that that index go from in the 90, you know, hundreds, the perfect range um, baseline. And it stayed up in the 90s and even in the first quarter of last year. And people ask Casey, why didn't it fall? And I said, remember what drove this market down? It was Fed rate hikes. They were too chicken to do one in January because they were afraid they were going to spook the market. They had February off, so they took February off to go see if the groundhog would tell them what to do. Then they came back in March and said, okay, there is inflation. Um, we'll do a quarter point. Then they took April off to go on spring break. And it wasn't until they came back in May and in, in, in the summer that they said, we've really got to start going with 75 basis point increases. All of that doesn't factor into things like consumer sentiment, the confidence indicators, small business index. Those are all in the Crepe index. And so those are what really then started to change when people realized the Fed was going to raise rates. They weren't going to keep quantitative easing, forget quantitative tightening. They're going to quantitative, we're going to screw you till it, it hurts incredibly bad, uh, you know, uh, kind of um, mode or cue. Uh, quantitative tightening to infinity and on. And so the, all of those metrics didn't really start to change until the summer. So we saw in, in the summer, June and the fall, the Crepe index go to an all-time low of 81. And it's bouncing around 82. And my forecast, and I write the narrative and been involved with it, is it will go below 80, um, set records we've never seen. And I'd look at that Crepe because it takes 10 of the best forward-looking indicators University of Michigan Consumer Confidence, NFIB Small Business Index, um, you know, the CPPI indices, they're all forward-looking. Nothing's out the rearview mirror like GDP. GDP is not in there. And it's not overly weighted in any one sector like employment or housing or commercial real estate. They're all very balanced. So if we're really in a recession and things are really correcting, you should see that permeate all of those categories. And that's what the CREPI does. So if you want a shortcut to seeing it all, uh, those, those are the ones, if you want to get into them piecemeal, I'd, I'd look at, you know, each of the, those indices. And when you get access to it, the workbook is available to you. So you can go into each Excel worksheet and look at each of those indices and how they're performing. So what I write is, so what caused it this time? Uh, you know, what caused it to decline? Or if it improved a little bit, what what caused that improvement? It's like the SPR releases and energy easing that eased the inflation over the summer. That's what caused it to level out a little bit. So I would say creppy and I would say just the capital side, the maturity defaults, if you're in office, if you're in an urban core with retail, if you've got leases that are maturing in the next two to three years, um, th there really is no capital for, for nobody on that. It's all locked up. The banks won't do it. Pension companies don't want it. They want industrial. They'll take multifamily because you've got the anomaly of the government-sponsored enterprises, Freddie and Fannie, that are an anomaly finance mechanism for multifamily that we've never had, and it's always helped multifamily out. And the Fed is still buying the mortgage-backed security. So unless the Fed pulls back on that, I think multifamily stays healthy. You can't afford to build a home, uh, so you're going to be stuck in a rental situation. And our affordable affordable housing situation is just going to get a lot worse. When I was out in Salt Lake, it was surprising to even those in the audience that were from out there that the median price of a home in Salt Lake City now is over a half million dollars. And the same thing's happening in Boise. So the lack of affordability that left California searching for it in places like the Intermountain West, it's gone. And 80% of the ski resort, the first responders, the teachers, uh, that that affordable, you know, that that uh, basic workforce element, 80% of them cannot afford to rent or buy in Salt Lake or the Utah market. That's scary.
Well, yeah, it, it is an interesting time. And the reason that I love having you as a guest on here is that every time we talk, I always think of more questions that I could ask. And then it always prompts me to want to make a note to see if I can get you back on down the road. And I know other people share that as well, because every time I have you as a guest, people always ask how they can get in touch with you. So <laughs> what what is that? Like, I'll, I'll leave a link for your LinkedIn and for Red Shoe Economics. I, it, those are the two best ways for people to get in touch. They are. And what I'll share with you is if they go to the website, the red www.redshoeeconomics.com um, um, and you go to the media tab at the top, all my presentations from every week are posted there and they can access them. So if you're looking at where I'm traveling, I was just out in L.A. What did he say about California? What did he say about Salt Lake? You know, the CSAM Institute member only uh, pre, uh, webinar that's coming up next Tuesday. They're all there and we don't we don't charge for that. So you can actually download them and view them. And then any papers that we do are there. My calendar is there so you can see where I'm going next. So if you're in one of those markets, you know, uh, just think about hooking up or send me a send me a message um, on that side. So we appreciate all the support and uh, we're starting our third year and it's it's been busier than, than can be, you know, periods. We find in real estate, no matter your skill, when periods when we're in free fall and heading to a, you know, hopefully getting to a trough, or we're in the market that's turning, that's when we're busiest because people just don't know, and they're trying to figure out what do I do, what do I sell, what do I buy, how do I reprice, how do I structure, and that's where we are right now. We're in that free fall mode, and um, I, the last thing I'd close on is I'll show you how impactful this financing thing is. So all of the commercial property price indices, whether it's um, Green Street, which is all the institutional quality, or whether it's CoStar or RCA, which are the broader um, uh, market in the, in the country and, and midstream assets, all of them show that prices started declining 10 to 15% in the, 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 the fall and, and winter of last year. That decrease was all because expenses were growing at three times what rents were. And so the NOI had to go down. Even if the cap rate didn't change, you had a lower MA, lower NOI and that caused the value to change. What wasn't in there was a change in the cap rate because of interest rates. And so if people will go back and retune themselves on the band of investment uh, math for figuring out a cap rate, because we're going to have fewer transactions. We're not going to know what the cap rate is. So it simply says, what's the cost of my equity? What's the cost of my debt? Put them together. That's what my cap rate should be. And when you do that and you look at uh, being able to a year ago, uh, have debt and equity at a cost structure that would justify a five to five and a half percent cap. And you fast forward that to today, the beginning of this year, we can't justify anything below seven and a half percent. And when you go from a five and a half cap rate to a seven and a half cap rate, 25% of your value is gone. That's what's ahead of us if this plays out. And that's what fear, that's what fear scares me the most is that we have not discovered the 25% decline because of the cost of capital increase in the cap rates. And that's all ahead of us. And most appraisers will be afraid to do it because they'll be afraid their bank client will say, we well, can't tell me the property dropped 25%. You appraised it for this much a year ago. I'm going to fire you. So they will be slow to recognize it. The same with the life companies. They all want those assets marked up and it's going to be a slow discovery and the ULI will have been right. There's this huge chasm between buyers and sellers that has to narrow. And what that means is that's how we get to a 40% price correction, especially in office. Maybe it's only 10 or 15% in industrial, maybe 20% in multifamily. And by the way, in the latest Green Street, the year-over-year -year decline or change in prices for multifamily was 20%. Now, who would have figured that? So it's going to be a bumpy year. It's all about capital. Well, if you're open to it, I'd love to pick the conversation up again, maybe in, in yeah. the fall, and we'll just see how these next six or seven months uh, uh, unfold, because uh, you've definitely given me a lot to think about. And I love the the resources that you provide on your website. So I'd highly encourage people to go and check that out. And uh, thanks once again, Case. I really appreciate your time. As always, I'll reach back out uh, in the next few months, to perhaps tee something up for yeah. the fall. And maybe we get there before Memorial Day to see if we if we're gonna have a you know memorial service over the last good economy in our lives. I, I think this is a long haul back. I think this is a best case a two, three year really severe recession. Uh, if it's anything like the 70s, which I correlated 18 months ago, all the factors that correlate to what we went through in the 1970s, massive deficit spendings, an unexpected market disruption. Then it was the OPEC. This time it was COVID supply chain. And then a gimmick by government. Then it was Nixon with price controls. Now it's the Fed and its balance sheet. All those three things are, are fast forwarded here today. And so um, I, I think, you know, best case is two to three years. Let's hope it's not eight to 10 years like 70, you know, 74 to 82, um, in which we had to basically reinvent the economy and figure out how to make cars 
that were no longer 70 feet in length with seven, with no cup holders and have cars that were only seven feet in length with 70 cup holders. I think from supply chain and a lot of structure of our economy, uh, there's going to be a lot of parallels to the 70s and early 80s. I hope I'm wrong. Well, let's tee up a conversation uh, around Memorial Day and we'll we'll pick it up from there. There it goes. Well, I hope, you, hope you're good. And uh, uh, if you're flying, good luck. Uh, I was in New York when the FAA grounded everybody a week ago. Uh, it's a good thing that didn't happen over the holidays. Uh, let's hope Southwest gets a new technology platform for its reservations. Um, the good news in, uh, in the GDP numbers today was almost half of that GDP was airline orders. So airlines are doing well. We're all doing boo leisure. And so there's lots of aircraft orders going on with Boeing and Airbus. So maybe, maybe that'll, maybe that'll lift us up. <laughs> oh, let's figuratively and literally. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks again, one, uh, Casey, uh, look forward to chatting further and encourage people to go and check out your website. Thank you so much, Chad. Take okay. care.